Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad that you've decided to join us. You may already know that we're taking a look at the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh Adventist Church for the second quarter of 2012. And this is lesson number eight in a series that is entitled Witnessing and Evangelism. And this particular lesson is entitled Equipping for Evangelism and Witnessing. It's a lesson for May 26 of 2012. And we, as always, we would like to begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our kind and wonderful Father, it would be a privilege for any one of us to work with you. But yet, we get so caught up in all the responsibilities and busyness of our lives that it's easy for us to not find time to do that. Now as we consider some of the ways in which we should prepare and we, we should get ready to, to actually go out to witness, guide us, help us to comprehend what we talk about, and then to put it into action is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Organization and final preparation. That's the subject of what we're basically going to talk about uh, today. When and how will we be ready to witness for the gospel? Do we need to have a lot of facts? I can remember the days when the idea was, well, you, you memorize 20 texts for each lesson. Uh, that was the approach. I mean, and woe betide the person who suggests that you depart from the standard format. Um, is that the way to go? Uh, just memorize a lot of texts and spit them out in the right order and pause a little bit of between each one and there you've made a lesson. I think there's a lot more to it than that. We've already suggested that what might matter most of all is love for your fellow men. And if you there's a, there's a quote in evangelism that okay. I think approaches that topic. Beseech the Lord in fervent prayer for help. Present Jesus because you know him as your personal Savior. Let his melting love and his rich grace flow forth from human lips. You need not present doctrinal points unless questioned. But take the word and with tender yearning love for souls, show them the precious righteousness of Christ to whom you and they must come to be saved. Okay. That doesn't, that doesn't sound like a, a rapid fire. I got 25 texts for you. Manuscript 27, 1895. And evangelism? 442.2. Okay. By the way, for those of you who have been listening to us and watching us in the past and may be interested, we have materials that cover this lesson of various, various audio and, and, and printed forms that can be found on our website. It's called Theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and you can find it on the web, and you can find that there the handouts that we use in uh, our discussions together. And they're there earlier than the lesson, so if yes. they want to have it before they go to their lesson, they can. Exactly. And this video is also available there. Yes, it is. And it's all free. Exactly. <laughs> so back to our discussion. Do we need a lot of facts in order to witness? Is that the secret? Now, you have to have something to say. You can't just, blah, 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 what do I say now? So, how do we prepare? I know that just the 25 text thing might seem very mechanical. Uh, we don't want that to be the, the story. You got to kind of know your audience, don't you? You have to know who you're going to talk to. Well, that would be nice. I mean, you know, when Jesus was in Perea versus out, out in the um, with the Jewish mm -hmm. territory, his his whole sermons and the, even his parables are different. Yeah. So this this passage that Norm read is that to a particular group of people, or or I mean, for Pete, my goodness, it would take forever for anybody to find out about the Sabbath and the state of the dead and all those well, other very important well, things not necessarily. here. <laughs> <Not necessarily. laughs> I, I, I find that, um, I find that mm -hmm. when you, you, you have that kind of relationship with people and they know you're a Christian, they, uh, they tend to ask questions. And I, m my personal experience, I remember working with a lady who just asked some very blunt questions, and I just finally said to her, I said, look, 
we we were in we were in school together, and I said we had a one one lunch period a week that we were free to do student activities, and I said, I'll meet you in such a room. You come with your Bible. You come with your questions, and I'll I'll do my best to answer them. And uh, it wasn't very long before she was baptized. So it's um, that's possible. I think it's that personal interaction. Yeah. And if they never find out that you're different than they are, they're not going to ask any questions. They've got all the questions that they know about. But when they, when, they, when they see this person falling in love with Jesus and oozing that kind of, of relationship, then they begin to think, now that's different than me. Why? Mm -hmm. What's he got? There's got. another thing we always need to remember. The good news is not about us. It's not about our local church. It's not about our worldwide organization. The good news is about God. So you ask them, talk about God. A lot of people, if you approach them and say, well, let's talk about the Sabbath, not interested. I would like to talk about what happens to people when they die, not interested. What do you think about God? Oh, well, you know, I have a lot of questions about him, da, 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 and you're off. Well, I can see the point of memorizing 20 items because, okay, you're talking about God, and then they ask you or you have to point something out in the Bible. Mm -hmm. I can't remember where the verse is, but it's in here someplace. Yeah. And so then if you have a list written down or have, you've memorized it, um, then... Yeah. And, and then make it about God. But from the Bible, introduce the person to his word also. And you can have, you can have things written. I mean, you can work out a series of things in your Bible. So here's a verse to read, and then it, right by in the margin there, someone say, go next to da, 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 da. I remember doing that when I was uh, young, the, the little thing that you do, which is fine. Uh, for beginners, that's, that's a great way to go. Well, I made a list once and talked to somebody, and... The list didn't apply to where the yeah. conversation went. <laughs> that, that, that's one of the one of the challenges, so, sure. Dennis. I suspect that the most effective testimony comes from a personal experience, mm -hmm. a personal relationship with God. Uh, and when that, that relationship exists, uh, it bubbles out. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't contain it. Yeah. You've got to you've got yeah. to express it. You've got to share it. How do we convince people that he really, really loves every single person and he would like everybody to be saved? If you could convince them of that, I think you're well on your way to making some progress toward the gospel. Well, they've heard other people say, um, if you're not of this group, you're not going to be saved. Or yeah. uh, people seem to having fun. Well, they're, they're going to go to hell for sure. And so maybe they, it's a preconceived notion, and they say, well, how can I be saved? Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a connection between them perceiving your love for them and believing about God's love for, for them, too. Yeah. Well, Ephesians 4.11 gives us a clue about what this is all about. It was he who gave gifts, that would be God, he appointed some to be apostles, others to be prophets, other, others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers. He did this for what reason? To prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ. Now that's, a, that's what God says is, is supposed to happen. Another relevant verse is in Matthew 9, 37. So he said to his disciples, the harvest is large, but there are a few workers to gather it in. Pray to the owner of the harvest that he will send out workers to gather in his harvest. Um, so God assures us that the harvest is plentiful. It may seem like, you know, Paul, when he first went to Corinth, thought, you know, I, I, there's no reason for me to waste very much time in this place. There's nobody here who wants to hear about God. And God says, wait a minute, not so fast. That I have a lot of people in this town, city, whatever you want to call it. And Paul spent how long there? A year and a half building up the church there in the place where he thought there's nobody here who wants to hear about Christianity. When we say equipping for evangelism and witnessing, 
you know, all of us don't equip the same way. No. Um, just to your talents, like someone that equips could be good at uh, baking something and sharing it and um, just sharing a little bit about God. Mm -hmm. Others can do the whole evangelistic campaign, mm -hmm. which I think is wonderful. But you can't ask everybody to do evangelistic no. campaign. But whatever you can do yes. uh, fits into the whole of what's happening. And God will have a person, um, <coughs> like they'll say, one will plant and one will tend the crops and one will harvest and uh, just do your duty. And there's some of us that can't bake bread. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> some of us have baked hundreds and thousands of loaves of bread our, in our career. Matthew 4.19 says, the words, quotes the words of Jesus. He said to James and John and Peter and Andrew, he just said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Did he say that because he was talking to fishermen? Or is that a general principle? You know, Matthew 28.19 um, which you're all familiar with, I'm sure. Let's just look at that in, for a second. 19 and 20, actually. says, Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them. So go, baptize, make them my disciples, I guess. Baptize, teach, you know, to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. So now, when they arrived wherever they went, did they use Norm's approach here that he just read about? They were just living nice little lives, and no, or did they have some doctrine here they were preaching? Well, the, the, the disciples, remember, they just walked around to the villages and healed people and raised people from the dead and, and walked into people's houses and say, uh, if they welcome, they say, okay, I'll stay here for a week or two, and... Uh, Things were a little different in those days. Well, man, if I could do that, witnessing would be no problem at all. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm glad <laughs> yeah. to hear that. A few healings you know, and wonders. What if you did something simple, like went around the neighborhood, knocked on the door and say, Hi, I'm here to answer questions about God. Do you have any questions about God? And they might say, No. And or they might say, Yeah, by the way, I do. And he, you know, and he might give you a question. Yeah. You could answer. I mean, it could be as simple as that. Well, we, we, before we just uh, jump in and think, boy, the disciples were perfect. They were just all ready to go. We need to remember a few things. First of all, read Acts 6 to 12, and you'll discover that they were not at all prepared to go to the world. They thought that the only world that mattered was the Jewish nation. And they weren't even quite sure they were going to go to all of them. You know, there were, there were classes, and, you know, you don't... You don't witness to tax collectors, and you don't witness to, you know, harlots, and you don't witness to Pharisees, because they're way off in their world over there. So when he first said this suggestion, he made such, such a suggestion to the disciples, they had no idea that he eventually intended for them to circle the globe, which they didn't, of course, in their day, but they, they covered the, you know, the, the civilized world of their day. Now, the Jews... There were Jews spread out pretty much throughout the world at, at mm -hmm. that time, weren't there? So are you saying that the disciples thought that Jesus saying go into all the world and teach means go to all the Jews in all yes. the world and teach? Exactly. So when, for example, in the recent National Geographic magazine, there is a, a feature article of where certainly tradition says all the apostles went, oh, it's, it's all over all over. So is that what they were were doing? Was they, that they were they went to to India and they found some Jews there and that's where they started or Well the truth is remember <coughs> that they didn't actually leave Jerusalem basically until Stephen was stoned. And then a terrible persecution started and they well I guess we better leave Jerusalem. It was Peter Mm -hmm. And Paul, that, that really were commissioned to take the gospel to the Gentiles, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where, did, where were they going in Jerusalem? Just they were on the corner? They, or? Well, that's a good question. <clears throat> Jesus said, go to Jerusalem, 
Judea, Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. That's what he told. Uh, look, look at an example. This is the major example we have in this uh, lesson, so we're going to look at it in some detail. Start with Matthew 14, and I'm going to start with verse 13. When Jesus heard the news about John, he left there in a boat and went to a lonely place by himself. Okay, uh, That's part of the story. Uh, the people heard about it, so they left the towns and followed him by land. If you look in, if you look in Mark and in Luke, you discover that the disciples have been out going two by two, all through Galilee, preaching and evangelizing and, and healing and even raising people from the dead, apparently. Uh, we don't know how many people the disciples raised from the dead, but Jesus told them to do that. And then they came back, and just about the time they came back to, to be with Jesus again, he found out that John had been beheaded. And so he told his disciples, well, come with me, and let's go apart to a quiet place, and let's see if we can have a little uh, time together. Well, they start out across the lake with a boat. And, of course, the Sea of Galilee is not a, not a big ocean. It's, it's not much bigger than a, it's about eight miles by 12 miles, yeah. something like that. So you can easily see any boat that heads out across there. And so people were starting to follow them in boats, and others were running along the shore watching. So they had very little time when they got to the other side by themselves. A, few, a little bit, I don't know, maybe an hour or two. And pretty soon people were gathering and crowding around Jesus and wanting help. And of course, as usual, Jesus had compassion on them and he began to heal and teach. And he did that all day long. And what happened? That evening his disciples came to him and said, It is already very late. This is a lonely place. Send the people away and let them go to the villages to buy food for themselves. They don't have to leave, answered Jesus. You yourselves give them something to eat. All we have here are five loaves and two fish, they replied. And remember, Andrew had found, found this small boy who had a lunch. And apparently, you I mean, little boys go for a whole day and they don't eat their lunch? How many of, of you have had little boys in your family that would do that? They eat their lunch for breakfast. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> if they can, yeah, they get away with it. But New King James puts it kind of interesting. He said, Jesus said to them, or they, they said to him, let them go into the villages and buy food. And then Jesus said to them, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, then bring them to me, Jesus said. Bring me the, the five little rolls and the fish to me. He took the five loaves and the two fish, looked up to heaven and gave thanks to God. He broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. Everyone ate and had enough. Then the disciples took up the 12 baskets full of what was left over. The number of men who ate was about 5,000, not counting women and children. Um, I would like to add a, the, the, the account of John, which adds a considerably different detail. After this, this, Jesus went across Lake Galilee, or Lake Tiberias, it is also called. A large crowd followed him because they had seen his miracles of healing those who were ill. So he suggests that they were following because of what? They're looking for hill healing, basically. They're looking for Jesus to do something for them. Jesus went up the hill and sat down with his disciples. The time for the Passover festival was near. So this gives us a clue about what time of the year we are. Passover occurs what time of year? What season of the year? Easter. Easter, yeah, spring, yeah, springtime. Um, Jesus looked around and saw that a large crowd was coming to him, so he asked Philip, where can we buy enough food to feed all these people? He said this to test Philip. Actually, he had already knew what he would do. Philip answered, for everyone to have even a little, it would take more than 200 silver coins to buy enough bread. And each one of these silver coins is, is a man's, a laboring man's wage for an entire day. So, you know, Come on into my house, all 20,000 of you, and I'll give you something to eat. That's what Jesus is saying, basically, right? Another of his disciples, Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother, said, There's a boy here who has five loaves and a barley bread and two fish, but they will certainly not be enough for all these people. And what does Jesus say? Bring them here. Have them sit down. There was a lot of grass there. Peter, through Mark, says there was a lot of green grass. It was the springtime. So all the people sat down there, about 5,000 men. Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to God, and distributed it to the people who were sitting there. He did the same with the fish, and they all had as much as they wanted. When they were all full, he said to his disciples, 
Gather the pieces left over, let us not waste any. So they gathered them all up and filled twelve baskets with the pieces left, left over from the five barley loaves which the people had eaten. So, How big were those baskets? Do we have hmm? any idea? Yeah, we do. We do. Um, I don't know. There's a specific name for them in Greek, and it's a Jewish basket. When he goes over and feeds the 4,000 in Gentile territory, they use a larger kind of basket. There's only seven baskets, so they use a larger kind of basket, and it's a, a basket that was used in the Gentile territory. I mean, are we talking about a quart, a pint, or oh, a no, gallon? No. Or we're, we're, talk we're talking pretty good-sized baskets, hmm. each one of them. Okay. Yeah. You know, characteristics of Jesus, he's compassionate, he's very organized, he wanted them to sit down, and he's very generous. They got all they mm -hmm. wanted to eat and they had leftovers to take home. Now, let's, let's think about what lessons we can learn from this, because that's obviously what our lesson wants us to do. This is among the Galileans. Jesus has not sent his disciples out yet, yet, um, notice I said, to the, to the Gentiles. Um, many of the people believe. Now, Jesus has just finished a whole year, spending almost his entire time. He has not gone down to Jerusalem during that year at all, even though there were several festivals. He has not gone to any festivals down in, to Jerusalem. And he's not going to this Passover, by the way. Um, but he spent a whole year ministering, and he's become so popular in Galilee that he doesn't even dare to go into town, because as soon as he shows up to the town, the whole place just mobs him. So when he, 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 when he decides to teach or preach, he goes out into the countryside and people come to him there. So that's the, that's the current state. And the disciples, especially with Judas urging them along, said, just this is the perfect time to grab Jesus and make him king. So that's what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and that's suggested in John six fourteen and 15. Yeah that they wanted to seize him and make him mm -hmm. king. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus had a very different idea. We talked about this. Um, have you ever wondered why Jesus fed them uh, barley loaves, little barley loaves and, and fish? He could have made it. If you're doing a miracle and you're God, why not give them uh, pasta and grape juice or you know whatever? I mean, fix them a nice meal. I think to them that was a nice meal, and that's what they were used to. Yeah. In the book Desire of Ages, page 366 and 367, it just says, he fed them the common food that they were accustomed to eating. That was a nice meal. Nothing fancy, but it was what they were used to. Why do you think there was 12 baskets left over? Is there any? That's that's a very good question. What, what happened to those 12 baskets that were left over? Well, why, why 12? 12 is a... Well, number. I mean, yeah, it's probably, that's probably the number of baskets they had available or something like that. Well, if they didn't have it, they would dump it out. <laughs> I don't know. But, well, but, I would love to take it back yeah, home and exactly. say, look at this miracle food. Yeah, and, and that's exactly what happened. what happened to those 12 baskets. They started gathering up and says, I want some of that. I want to give it to my brother. I want to give it to my sister, my mom, my dad, my, my cousin. I want everybody in my town to try some of this. This is the best stuff I've ever eaten, you know? Which became a witness in itself. Exactly, because as soon as they're passing out the bread, what would people say? Where did you get this? Mm -hmm. Why does it taste so good? And or, then, or they might have just been coming on. You know where this came from? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Now, what was the the lesson in the whole okay. thing? Okay, and because I, because two things happen. One, the the multitude got fed, but then there was something else after that because yeah. they were expecting him to feed them again. You know, okay. and it didn't happen. But, uh, you said he was generous, but he was generous for that one meal. Yeah. But they after that, really hungry after that? No, but uh, they they stuck around, didn't they, and wanted to be fed again? Oh. Well, Norm's comment reminds me of something. We're supposed to be learning something about evangelism. Have we had the spiritual food, and are we now ready to say, "Man, try some of this"? Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Oh, that's a good start. 
That's well, a good. <laughs> when, when you get into the Bible and you see the how it all fits together mm -hmm. and you learn things that you think this was just a dead book, you tend to tell people, hey, you know, this is this is really something. You should, mm -hmm. you know, read this and come yeah. to, come study. Now, the most if, that, if that's a lesson, though. Okay, well, if that is the lesson, that's one. Well, that's just um, one, one of many lessons. Why did you stop? I thought he was supposed to be a fountain that never ends. Well, sure. Why not? So. I mean, if if you're so full of the Holy Spirit, you're so full of the teachings of the Bible and so forth, as as Dennis has already suggested that you can't keep quiet about it. What happens when you get together with people? Look at this. Try some of this. Mm -hmm. The most intellectual. Those who are looked upon and praised as the world's great and gifted men and women are often refreshed by the most humble, simple words spoken by one who loves God, who can speak of that love as naturally as worldlings can speak of the things which their minds contemplate and feed upon. Words, even if well prepared and studied, have little influence, but the true honest work of a son or daughter of God in words or in service of little things done in natural simplicity will unbolt the door which has long been locked to so many souls. There you go. And reference again. And that's Evangelism 443.3. Yeah. Well, so let's follow through. We're not done with what we can learn from this story. Um, we suggested that he People took pieces of this. They went home and they talked to their friends. Um, what else can we learn from this story? What did Jesus do before he ate? One of the things they learned from it is this guy could feed our armies. Yep. Yep. We're going to get to that in a moment. He thanked God. He thanked God. Okay. Do we always do that? I hope so. I have, I have mentioned, I think maybe on this program, that we recently were on a trip and... Um, I, we always pray before we eat. Uh, we were held our hands, and our family group, and, and, and bowed our heads in prayer. And someone came up to us, a waiter at the restaurant, and said, wow, he was from an Eastern European country. He says, I have read, I've seen this in movies. I've read about it in books, but I have never. And this guy had been working at that restaurant for years, years. Hundreds and hundreds of people came through there. He says, it's the first time I've ever seen anybody actually do it. Now, we said some things to him. And obviously, you know, at a, a, a restaurant, you're eating, you know, somebody's serving you and you're eating. You don't have a lot of opportunity to witness. But um, I, don't, yeah, I don't think he forgot that experience. Maybe there'll be another time when someone will have a chance to witness to him. Well, in his reading and in watching the movies, there must have been something that caught his attention. There must have been some kind of a desire, some kind of a yearning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, to see it. Mm -hmm. So carry on now with our, back to our, to our story here. Uh, 20,000 people, including women and men, including uh, 5,000 men, including women and children. If you, I mean, I, you know, I, I was a small boy once. I still sometimes feel like a small boy, a little kid. If you saw somebody just passing out the food and they just keep doing this and they keep doing it, what would you do if you were a small boy? Well, you'd probably want to mimic it. Well, either that, well, at least you'd want to watch what was going on. Yeah, you'd want to look inside that basket. Yeah. These what, 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 <laughs> exactly. It's like having... pulling rabbits out of a basket. They just kept coming, you know. Especially if it was my basket. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm sure they must have stirred up all kinds of stuff. And kids, and think, the baskets probably materialized. Yeah, <laughs> you know? very likely. That's possible too. Why'd you take the baskets if they were empty? You must have. Yeah. Not pet the baskets. What do you think the children said when they got home to talking to their friends? And we've talked about the adults and their careful, studied response when they got home. What do you think the kids said? Kids but are here, less scared to say things. They just mm -hmm. blurt it out. Well, what would they blurt out? What do you think? They saw amazing things. I, I don't... Wow! You yeah. know what? <laughs> These guys took a little boy's lunch and fed 20,000 people. Have you ever seen such a thing? But the only thing is, when we go out and evangelize, we cannot do that. Mm -hmm. 
I haven't ever made that happen. And so we have to stick within what we can do. Which is fine, but we're now talking about spiritual food. How much spiritual food do you have available? Well, and if you have spiritual food available, have you made it so that you can transfer it to another? Because you could be, have all sorts of spiritual food and be unable or unwilling to talk to another. So then mm -hmm. the spiritual food just sits inside your head and... But one of the things that Norm read was it's <coughs> not necessarily the words that you speak. You know, the things, that you yeah, do. It, it's the things you do, the interest that you show. Yeah. If the disciples could go out, and they did, go out and heal, then they ought to be able to go out and do this too. Yeah. And remember... And, and didn't uh, Norm read from one of his passages, from the passage there, that that's basically what Jesus was saying to, was it Phillips, you know, why don't you, well, you know, go ahead and feed these people. Yeah. I think um, a lot of <coughs> non-Christian people don't feel that they can pray. They have, haven't, like you said, experienced it. So one of the things you could do if you get an opportunity, if you run into people that are having problems or something, say, would you like, would you like to pray for it right now? Or, and then uh, you holding their hands or just bowing your heads, pray, and that way they uh, actually hear a prayer mm -hmm. and it models it for them. Yeah. And, and it shows you really care and uh, then their, their care is brought to the heavenly throne and they feel yeah. so good about that. Mm -hmm. The miracles were often done on people who really didn't appreciate it and who went and just grabbed it and ran. But the people who, who understood his, his earnestness for them, his love for them, the way he spoke with them, the, uh, the things that we could mimic, if we had the same love for those people that he had for those people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I suspect it would come out in whatever abilities we have. Mm -hmm. We may not be able to do big miracles, but we can do little things with that same spirit. Yeah. So was this an event, was it an analogy, the whole thing? Well, let me, let me add. Because I, I, I don't see that this, the disciples or the apostles didn't feed that 5,000 or big no. things like that. No. So well, was the whole thing just to get the idea across for spiritual food? Well, Jesus has been ministering to these same Galileans for a whole year now. Mm -hmm. And this is a culminating activity. See, He has demonstrated that he has control over the elements. He's demonstrated that he has control over, you know, the food in this case. He's, he's, he controls death. He controls health. He controls everything. And they have seen that. Now, we, you know, it'd be easy for us to say, well, you know, obviously Jesus did all kinds of things. I, I, just, I can't do any of those things. But many times in the Gospels and, I mean, the New Testament and in the writings of Ellen White, many times she says, if you impart, you will receive more. Impart? Practice makes perfect. You'll receive more. What, what all does that imply? Practice makes perfect? What else does that imply? You gain... That means you're going to... more than what you're giving. Yeah. And how would that work, actually, you think? Well, it works, works a lot of ways. Um, I mean, one of the great lessons of the Bible is God gives you something, and you use it, and he gives you more of it mm -hmm. to use more. The more... The more you use the, the talents that he's given you, mm -hmm. the more talent he gives you. Even your capacity to receive is increased. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you might surprise yourself? Which is kind of scary. Yeah. In some I, 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 I know that you recently received a reward for teaching, Jay. Uh, do you think you would have gotten that reward back when you first started? I'm surprised I got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but th th think about this. The reason, at least one of the reasons why you got that reward is because you have taught that su those subjects and taught those subjects and taught those subjects until you feel very comfortable with them. And the students recognize that. They recognize that you're very comfortable with what you do 
you're very familiar. You know, it's very unlikely that in a given class, they're going to come up with some kind of a problem that you've never seen before and have no idea about. So you feel very comfortable with the subject. And they, they sense that. They know. They know the guy's up there, what's going to happen next, you know, kind of thing, you know. Uh, they can tell that right away. So what this is saying to us, if you practice, you learn one lesson from the Bible and you practice that on somebody, the more you practice it, the easier it is to do it the next time. That lesson, and more than likely, what will happen is they'll ask you a question. Think, boy, how do I answer that question? We need to go and, 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 and try to figure it out. I've heard this described in another way, that um, things won't happen unless you act. Mm -hmm. When you step forward, you, you put yourself in a situation, then God has something to work with. Put your mm -hmm. feet in the water. Yes. Well, but stepping into the Jordan. These 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 learning things. When God gives you <clears throat> now an another increased ability. Okay. It's it's you're not skilled at it. You're not practiced, mm -hmm. and it's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. and, That's exactly right. And you have to massage it, and you have mm -hmm. to. You have to stick your neck out and, you know, right. it's a whole lot more fun just to stay back here where you know. Exactly. You take this new stuff all the time and, mm -hmm. oh, now, now I've got to do this too. Yeah. And, and it, obviously at that time, at that point in time, Jesus' example says it's time for a little praying. Preparation and prayer. Okay. Say, God, guide me through this. You know, what happens? Yeah, but you also think you know you can do it wrong, you can mess things up, you can get in, in trouble. You know, before our program, you mentioned something about John the Baptist. Are, are we gonna? I think that would be a good thing yeah. to talk is about. That, it? Is that? Are we? Are we coming to that, or was that just a simple well, thing? I guess, I guess where I'm, I'm going. With, I, I guess where I was. The thought that was crossing my mind was, you know. John the Baptist got himself in a little bit of trouble here, and he lost his head over it. Mm -hmm. um, he went and he approached uh, the king. We shouldn't condemn sin, in other words, huh? Well, my my question, <laughs> the question was, was was he in the wrong spot? Was that what he was supposed to do? Uh -huh. Was he? I mean, was he? You're getting off track here, but was this was this preparing the way for the Messiah, or is there more to what his role was than we recognize, or did he did he make a wrong decision here? Was his ministry cut short? And if that's the case, then you know what's the chance the same thing could happen to me? I I, I feel this, we, you know, we, I've, we, I've, I've I've launched out on faith in territory that. I couldn't see exactly where I was going, but I was going there by faith based upon the experiences that the Lord gave me some talents, and I went and it worked, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And then I, I we, blunder and embarrass him and me too. We certainly wouldn't want to take any risks for, on behalf of God, would we? Well, that, But what it, if it doesn't turn out right? That's well, I, I think that's where we have a God who if we do something to the best of our ability and do it with the right intent and it doesn't work out right, we have a God that's big enough to manipulate that and turn it into something good. Mm -hmm. Well, but yeah. there, there are times, even Ellen White talks about times in which the work has been complicated mm -hmm. because of things people did, you know, are, and you are can... Are suggesting that uh, John the Baptist uh, made a mistake or no. acted errantly? Uh, did he not fulfill his mission? Well, it, it would be easy for us to say, well, if John the Baptist had just moved up the river a little ways, you know, maybe out of, or across the river, out of, out of Herod's territory, maybe he could have kept well, on that, preaching. That same question has come up about Paul. Exactly. Why did you go to Jerusalem? I well, mean, Jesus moved several times. Yeah. He moved out of Jerusalem, out of Judea, out of Galilee. He moved out into the Gentile territory yeah. to keep from losing his life earlier. Yeah, but he finally walked into Jerusalem. That's right. Intentionally. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, these things raise questions. Well, 
we need to carry on with the rest of the story, yes? I have one other question. This story of the feeding the 5,000 is in all four Gospels. Mm -hmm. What's the significance of that? Is this a really important story? Yes, it is. And that's, part of that depends on what we're going to talk about next, so okay. hang on. Early the next morning, well, we know what happened that night. It would be fun to talk about it, but I'm not going to take time. If you, you can look in Matthew 14, 29 to 32, he, Jesus came walking across the water. You know, just casual stroll across the water. Um, <laughs> you know, and three o'clock in the morning, and the disciples see this ghost, what looked like a ghost to them, coming on the water, and they're panicked. And Jesus, there's no worry, nothing to worry about. I'm just walking over here to find out how you're doing. And Peter says, well, if it's so casual as all that, why don't I, I come out? And, and Jesus said, come on. And of course, he's, he, he, Ellen White suggests he, he was doing fine so long as he kept his eyes on Jesus. And he looked around the other side and was, look at me, I'm doing it. You see, you see what I'm doing? I'm walking on the water here. He starts sinking. Hey, boys, hey. <laughs> have a look. <laughs> anyway, the next morning they're in Capernaum. And what happened? Do you remember? People came for more food. People came for more food. I mean, that was good food, right? And why wouldn't you want to Price go back? Price is right, I mean, my least. goodness. <laughs> and it tasted good. <laughs> okay. Well, the disciples also were very, especially Judas, was very, very upset that Jesus had not allowed them. He said, here is the perfect opportunity. The, the huge crowds, they're getting ready to go down to Jerusalem for the Passover ceremony. Let's crown Jesus king right now, and we'll, we'll advance with thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of Galileans. We'll march down to Judea, and no one will be able to resist us, and here's our king. He actually thought he had a better plan than Jesus had. Mm -hmm. Yep. He thought, I can, I can work this out, and we can get this thing done. Sure. He's being way too conservative. Exactly. Well, so the next morning, they're in Capernaum, and what happens? Everybody showed up to have breakfast, right? And Jesus said some pretty mm -hmm. scary, maybe, thoughts. But also, in part, to see the magic again. Mm -hmm. Everybody who didn't get part of the meal didn't get to actually see what happened. They wanted to see what would happen. You know, they wanted to see it. They want to see, you know, we want to see it too, right? There were probably people who were at the back of the back of the crowd before that came early to get up yeah. close so they could see this happening. Well, it says John 6, verse 22, Next day the crowd which had stayed on the other side of the lake realized that there had been only one boat there. They knew that Jesus had not gone in it with his disciples, but they, that they had left without him. And what had Jesus done during the night? Walked across the lake. He'd gone up to the mountains to pray. He Everybody went up else. by himself into the mountains to pray first, and then he walked across the lake. Other boats, which were from Tiberias or, or Capernaum, came to shore near the place where the crowd had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Because the word got around, so everybody's gathering, where is this Jesus? Where is this Jesus? You know. When the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they got into those boats and went to Capernaum looking for him. And then Jesus, and I, I won't go into the details, John 6, starting with verse 25, he starts saying some pretty unusual kind of words. W what did he say? He told people that they must eat his flesh and drink his blood if they were going to be truly his people. Yeah. Verse 20, 35 in John 6, I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. Those who come to me will never be hungry. Those who believe in me will never be thirsty. And they said, yeah, we know. You, you did that yesterday. Just do it again today, right? Now I told you that you have seen me but will not believe. Everyone whom my Father gives me will come to me. I will never turn away anyone who comes to me because I have come down from heaven to do not my own will but the will of him who sent me. And he went on, and you know, and the people were grumbling. Um, People started grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. So they said, this man, Jesus, is son of Joseph, isn't he? We know his father and mother. How then does he, he, he now say he came down from heaven? Jesus answered, stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him to me and so forth. And finally, he said those words that really made him wonder. Verse 53, Jesus said to them, I am telling you the truth. If you do not eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you will not have life in yourselves. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them to life on the last day. 
And you may know that in other parts of the world, people with very different religions than Christianity have accused Christians of, be car of being cannibals. Well, then what did he mean? That was pretty, uh, pretty graphic language to mm -hmm. be using there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was very symbolic. I mean... Did they get it? Well, obviously not. They were looking for some food. Mm -hmm. There's people today that don't get it. There's Christians today that don't get it. Well, Jesus recognized, partly because of this experience, partly because of what happened to John the Baptist, that it was time for him to move to the next stage in his ministry. What did he do? Very soon thereafter, he and his disciples just disappeared. Nobody could find them. They, moved, they went into Gentile territory, territory, all the way up to Tyre and Sidon. Can you give, uh, what did Jesus mean? Um, you have to drink my blood. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Yeah, so that is how you have to, you have to. Now, obviously, if we're going to literalize this, which we, we're not going no, to, he, uh -uh. you know, we don't even have access to the body of Jesus now. So what did he intend to say? But when we're evangelizing, that's part of the message we need to give to the people. So what is a handy dandy way of summarizing that? Okay. I when did he expect them expect us to understand these these comments. Mm -hmm. Well, think about it for a moment. What happens to the food that you eat? It goes inside you. It becomes part of you. It goes in it your becomes a part of you. It goes in your cells and gives you energy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Exactly. Which they didn't know about. But <laughs> well, but they, they, re they, they recognize that they didn't do too well if they didn't take it in. Well, that's, that's the whole point right there. Yeah. I mean, you just take in Jesus to be part of you, and that's yeah. that's That's simple. what he intended for them to understand, okay? You need to think about what you've learned from me. You need to think about what I've said. I've been among you preaching and teaching for all this time. What have you learned? You need Take to it in. Internalize it. And make it a part of you. That's why he had to move to the next step, though, because they weren't mm -hmm. quite getting it yet. Well, and, and this raises some questions. Who did he take with him? The ones that should have gotten. The ones that had been ministering to others. I mean, you would have thought these people had it, right? They've been out two by two ministering all over Galilee. Supposedly, he took the, the people who, who, who least needed his ministry, he took them off into Gentile territory. Why did he do that? They still didn't get it. And they still didn't get it all the way after his crucifixion and resurrection. But he was resurrection. planting those seeds for later consumption. It, it was also showing that uh, that what what he was and what his message was and what he came to do wasn't just for Jews, mm -hmm. it was for everybody. So that's mm -hmm. one one reason. Yeah. And when he's up there and he's working with his disciples and so forth, he asked some very significant questions. Do you remember what one of those, can you pick out one of those questions that was really important found in Matthew 16? Anybody remember? That when he says, who, who do people say I am? Who do people say I am? And what did they answer? Everything but the Son of God. <laughs> everything but the <this>, Well, <laughs> not quite everything but the Son of God, but they, they, they reflected the thinking of the Jews of their day. Some people said, well, maybe you're the prophet that Moses talked about. Some people said, well, there's some hints in Jeremiah that maybe he's coming back, maybe you're Jeremiah. And others said, well, Elijah is being is prophesied at the end of Malachi and everybody's waiting for Elijah. Maybe you're Elijah and so forth. And what did he say to them? Herod was worded it was the John the Baptist back. Yeah. yeah. Herod said, was, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? And his disciples who had all this training and they, they had been with Jesus for a long period of time, they knew immediately what the answer was, right? Yeah. Peter got it, though. Peter came up with the right answer, at least temporarily. Yeah. And what did he say? You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Exactly. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon. For Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. 
But you know, Peter, like <clears throat> so many of us, then he stuck his, stuck his foot in his mouth. And a few sentences later, Jesus is telling Peter, get behind me, Satan. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, that's humans. We can do something really right, and then right away we'll do something really wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I was talking about earlier. <laughs> You read about the really right part or the really wrong part. <laughs> well, you, you, you get this, this blessing of, of, of power and you, you use it and then you get a little more and then you get in trouble. Have you ever had um, problems in teaching? Ever had something come out the way, not quite the way you wanted it to? On more than one occasion. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you do? Did you stop teaching? Well, sometimes I thought I should. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, that's the point, you see. That's the point. We can make mistakes, but what do you do? You go out and you try it, you try again the next day until you do a better job. Yeah. So, coming on to some other parts of, this, of, the, of the lesson, 1 Peter 5.8 has some very important words. We may go out and think, oh, we've got this field out there that's just brimming with a harvest, ready to be harvested, and so forth. Let's just get on with it. We, we can't forget that there's somebody else out there. And what's that other person? Who is it? And what are they doing? Satan, the devil, roaming around lo yeah. like a lion looking for someone to devour. Yeah. And especially the person that's bringing the gospel. Exactly. You are most in harm's way when you're doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The devil is absolutely opposed to any kind of gospel spreading that we want to do. I, I have this theory that when things are going bad, when you're trying to do God's work, that maybe you're really close to pay dirt because uh, the devil is really uh, mm -hmm. kicking and screaming. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Here's a question for you. There's a group of people that apparently will come together, it says in, in, in Revelation 7. Um, uh, well, let's, let's, let's look at that for a moment. Look at Revelation 7, the first three or four verses there. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds so that no wind should blow on the earth or the sea or against any tree. Very familiar passage, hopefully, to Seventh-day Adventists. And I saw another angel come up from the east with the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels to whom God had given the power to damage the earth and the sea. The angel said, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we mark the servants of our God with a seal on their foreheads. Now, we've talked about this before. The seal represents what? Our settling into the truth, our thoughts. It means someone who is so settled into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, they understand the truth and they're committed to it. They're really committed to it. The, that's what we're looking for. Well, these people have been sealed, and I was told that the number of those who are marked with God's seal on their foreheads was 144,000. Now, what do we know? We're not going to, it's not time, we don't have time to talk about a huge discussion of the 144,000, but this is the group of people who will carry God's final message to the earth, and they will go through the time of trouble and see Jesus come again. Now, here's my question. Is the devil likely to be more disturbed if we go out into the world and bring one or two new converts into the church, or maybe even a dozen new converts into the church? Or is he more likely to be disturbed if we're working inside the church and we work with other church members further along in the process to help seal them and settle them into the truth? He had a two-prong attack. I think he would uh, do both. He would yeah. be against especially getting them settled into the truth inside the church, yes. There, there's room for both. Oh, absolutely. I'm not saying there isn't the, room for the, both. The, the extreme on the other one is you just sit there and go over the same plowed ground over yeah. and over and over. And people have been added to the church for millennia. See, what the devil is worried about is that core group that are going to come together and God is going to say, these are the, my people who are so settled into the truth, they can't be shaken. These are the ones who are going to carry the gospel right through to the end. So maybe there's as much evangelism that needs to be happening within the church as there is out there in the public. 
sometimes we neglect to think about that. Mm -hmm. So the church really needs to get ship shape and solid in what mm -hmm. it thinks. Well, we've already suggested that there, there's going to be, we're going to make mistakes. Thomas Edison was famous for saying what? It's not a, fa it's not a mistake, it's not a failure if you learn something. Okay? And, and Babe, Ruth's, Babe Ruth struck out more times than he um, hit balls. So. Yeah. So, two major areas of preparation are needed for effective witnessing. We must learn through instruction from others and our practical experience to how to do it successfully. But first, we must have the spiritual preparation that comes from a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. This will lead us to take the same approach to the unconverted as Jesus did. And what happens? Well, how does God feel about that? Look at 2 Peter 3, 9. There's some things we need to be absolutely certain about. The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, as some think. Instead, he is patient with you. That's talking about us. Because he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants all to turn away from their sins. Does God want us to succeed in this work? Absolutely. He wants every person out there to recognize that they're a child of God. And, and to, we succeed. And we succeed. So if we have God on our side, whether we're planting, whether we're preparing the earth, whether we're fertilizing, whether we're watering, whatever it's, you know, we may not be the one who's doing the harvesting. That's right. Maybe we're, we're going next door and handing somebody a, a loaf of homemade bread, you know. Those kind of things. With well, a pamphlet under it. Well, even that, <laughs> even that. But that's the kind of stuff that, you know, the disciples were known because they loved each other. Jesus said, you'll, you'll surprise the whole world if you love each other. You go out and give somebody a loaf of bread and they'll say, what's with this guy? And I tear this bread apart as they're poisoning. You know, what, what, why is this person handing out bread? By the way, the person who makes the best bread at our potluck is a man. Okay. Well, Ministry of Healing, page 149, says every church should be a training school for Christian workers. We can be sure that Satan is doing everything he possibly can to oppose that kind of thing. And we need to think about the tools. Some people will need the 25 techs. Other people will want computers and, and projectors so they can pr project it on the wall. There are various things. But God will help every one of us if we're willing to move forward. If we're willing to take up the challenge and say, I want to be a part of finishing the gospel. And this lesson is calling every one of us to do that. See you next week. <laughs>